All right, guys, pardon the audio. I'm not sure how it's going to sound. I'm out and about and uh, getting a quick walk in. I'm off on my holidays tomorrow, so I had to do this quick intro to our guest today. Our guest is a young guy by the name of Andres Bernal, and he is a real estate investor based in the US now, but he was born in the Caribbean in a place called the Dominican Republic. Now, Andres moved to the US on a tennis scholarship, believe it or not. So he is our first tennis pro to come on the podcast, but it's all about real estate. We're not talking about really anything else other than real estate in this sense. He, he's got some great insights. One of the things that uh, you'll appreciate about Andres, he's kind of resourceful, managed to go and get his first property um, pretty quickly in the US, despite having a visa and 20 banks turning him down. Then in addition to that, he, uh, he, he roped in one of his aunts to help him put together the deposit because he literally didn't have any money at all to go and buy his first property. Within six months, he was onto another property. And so it's an interesting story. He's really interested in the B or 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 method. And um, one of the things that you really should listen to is his experience in joining one of those really expensive uh, property real estate education uh, programs. He spent 20,000 or more than 20,000 on a program and got very little from it. So it's, um, it's time for me to put in my plug for my little program. Just kidding. Um, so listen, it's a good interview. I think you're gonna get some good value from it. In particular, you young guys, that are thinking, how are you going to get started? And uh, quite a few of you have been messaging me, asking me this very question. So here's a guy who's come up with a, an example. Now, I know funding in the US is quite different to funding here in Ireland and funding in the UK. So you're not going to find direct correlation between them, but some of the ideas are worth looking at into. So without further ado, my interview with Andres Bernal. Andres Bernal. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very excited to be here. Andres, as you know, we have a very international audience here. We have guys listening from all over the world. You're in the US. Just tell us exactly where in the US are you and uh, what's going on with the weather outside your window? Yeah, so I'm in Connecticut, which is the East Coast. Um, I live in a little town in Connecticut. Um, and yeah, the weather, uh, supposed to snow tomorrow. It's, uh, the winter, uh, could be rough. Could be, this has been like a mild winter. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the spring comes, uh, soon because I, I love the warm <laughs> weather too. So. Well, I was just going to ask, like, what is a guy that was born in the Dominican Republic doing living in Connecticut <laughs> in the cold with the snow outside? Tell us about your upbringing and, uh, and, and how you sort of ended up in the U S. Yeah, so I came to the U.S. in 2012. Uh, I came as a professional tennis player. And the reason why I came to Connecticut is because the, the coach at the time says, hey, I, I train you for free. Once you start making money, then I can uh, get paid, whatever. But right now you have the potential. So he was the one that offered, you know, they opened the door for me. So I'm like, uh, I'm going to go there. I'm going to play professional and see how it goes. So, yeah. Brilliant. And tell us, so 10 years in the U.S., um, how lo how much of that has been professional, sort of as a professional tennis player? So I played only for almost two years. Um, and the reason uh, why tennis is, is a very tough sport to start in the sense of like you don't make a lot of money uh, at the beginning. Uh, you actually I was on the on the I lost like 18 to 20,000 just because even if you win a tournament, uh, at that, you know, at, at the entry level, it's like two thousand dollars. But well, guess what? Going to Europe, it's not just a flight ticket. It's around there, not counting the hotels, you know, and all that. So uh, I have a few sponsors that help me out. But um, yeah, I played for two years. I don't regret it. It was the one of the best experiences I ever had, traveling all over. I wish I could have uh, visited more places. Uh, but you know, when you go for work, you go for work. You don't like. You don't go on vacation, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I get it. 
Um, well, I mean, you're the first professional tennis player that we've had on the podcast, so you're most welcome. But we are a real estate podcast, and obviously real estate is is what we're here to talk about today. So you did two years as a professional tennis player. Then, like, was it at that point that you jumped into real estate, or had you already been looking at that prior to sort of moving to the U.S.? Yeah, so my story is very interesting about um, how do I got into real estate. Uh, so I... I I used to rent and my landlord uh, was kicking me out, not because we were not paying, but because uh, I think they wanted to sell the house. Got so it. at that time, I'm like, listen, if I live here, I'm going to I'm going to definitely buy my own place. I don't know how the numbers are going to work. I don't know. I wasn't I wasn't a professional visa at that time. And um, I went to a lot of hurdles, a lot of hurdles to get a loan just because I was on a visa. So uh, I'm like, you know, I'm going to start investing. I'm going to buy my own place, small condo. And then if I move, I can just rent it out. And the numbers back then make sense. And still today makes sense. So I'm so glad that I did it. I think that created the spark of, of what the real estate is. So, so describe your first property deal then. I mean, given all of the hurdles you had to jump through and all that kind of stuff. I mean, when you say hurdles, you know, does it, is, does the amount of the deposit or like what, what were the numbers looking like from your perspective? Well, um, you know, the hurdles in that I had uh, to invest was I was uh, in a, in a visa in the U S they don't, they don't want to land on a person that is on a three-year visa. Why? Because you can fly away and then default on the loan. Yeah. So my mortgage broker at the time, I told him, hey, listen, this is going to be rough. It's, I'm on a visa, so don't give up. After the 20th bank, uh, I got a yes. And I almost don't buy that deal. And I think I don't know how my life would be um, if I wouldn't start there. But I, I told him, just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. He was like getting exhausted. But I'm so thankful that um, I got approved from a bank from California. And that's how it started. Uh, and after that, um, all the loans and everything was easier because I had a record. I have a history of getting loans. So my actually first, my actually first investment was um, what we call here a three family, which is a three unit apartment. And I actually used the, all the strategies without knowing that today that was going to be like a huge strategy, right? So I bought a, I bought a three family. Uh, I bought it at a market um, price for two hundred and ten thousand dollars. What? When was this? What year? Two thousand sixteen. December two thousand sixteen. Yeah. So then, what I did was uh, I used what it's called an FHA program, which is the lowest down payment that you can get here in the U.S. Besides uh, being a veteran, uh, and it's a three and a half percent down payment. Wow, that's low, yeah. That's really low. And the only condition is you have to live there for a year and it has to be your primary residence, right? The So I got that uh, loan and not only that, but I asked the seller if it can cover some closing costs. So at the end, I had to pull like, it was it was around like 15, 16,000. So he covered, I think about, about five or 6,000. Uh, and then um, the down payment, a lot of people don't know this, but the down payment can be gifted by a family member. Right. So one of the creative things that I did was I, I called my aunt and said, hey, aunt, can you give me $10,000? Because I didn't have any money. I was like, I, want, I was determined to buy, but I didn't have any money. So we made an agreement where I paid her $200 a month and, um, and she will give me the money. And so you paid... Two hundred dollars a month until the full ten thousand was repaid. Correct. Great, nice family loan. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a great program. Uh, most people now are, are knowing about that program, but um, it's um, yeah, it's 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 not easy in the sense of for if you're selling FHA, it's a little hard because they ask for for a good livable conditions. Uh, yeah, like yeah. The, there's no peeling pain, nothing like can be like, it, they're very rigorous about if you're selling a house, like you can have a hard time, but if you're buying, uh, it's, a, it's a great program. Brilliant. Well, so you got into it that, and can you just take us back before that? Uh, like what gave you the idea of investing in real estate? Um, did you mention that your fam, you had a family member, like a, co a cousin or an uncle or, oh, your godfather maybe or something like that? Yeah, so... 
you know, growing up, um, we rented the whole my whole life, um, basically. So until until recently, my parents bought a place. But um, the one thing that I saw my godfather, uh, which I really admire, is my godfather. He started from the bottom. And he started building houses. Uh, he started working for somebody else. Then he started uh, building houses. And I'm like, this is the richest person that I know. He's doing real estate. There must be something. I think the sparks start there. Got it. Um, but then um, the the real weekend, I will say the weekend that everything started, I don't even remember what year it was. But one day I was burned out. I was working 60 hours a week. And if you teach that amount, you must be insane. I think I, looking back, I think I was insane. But um, I this, was is a, this, this is as a tennis instructor, is it? As a tennis instructor, yes. I was working uh, 60 hours a week, uh, 50 to 60. And then uh, I realized, like, I'm getting burned out. Uh, how can I? I literally Google, how can I retire early? <laughs> and uh, three things came up. It says you can invest in businesses. You can invest in stocks. Or you can invest in real estate. So businesses is something that I was like, oh, one day I'm going to do that, uh, whatever. And then stock is something that I didn't understand. So one of the rules of investing is like, don't invest in something that you don't understand. Of course. And the, and the third thing was uh, real estate. And I'm like, huh, okay. So I'm like, let me let me just go the real estate route. And that's where everything sparked. And I'm like, I, I'm going to one day, I don't know how, I don't know when. I think that's part of like the secret, right? Uh, I'm going to just make it. And tell me this, like, I mean, to go from, okay, I'm going to get into real estate to the point where you're applying for the mortgage. Like, what's the time between those two? Like, when you first read about real estate and owning your own property, was it like uh, that is five a years? Uh, so at that time, I bought my first place already. Okay. okay. So I bought a small condo. That was like my first not investment because it was I, I was living in there. I was not making any money. It was not an asset. Right. But then uh, at that time, I'm like, that was when I was like burning out uh, from my job, from my nine to five job. And that's when I said, um, I need to invest in real estate. Great. Okay. And so you had the three family place. Yeah. So you were renting the other two, I presume, and you were living in one of them. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was a great, great strategy. And this is something that I recommend to everyone because- in the U.S., you can uh, get an FHA loan and you can buy up to four units. Okay. Four apartments. It's like the limit because that's considered residential. And that's what I recommend to everyone. And there's a there, now there's a huge debate on like the, the social media about like, oh, but house hacking, I'm losing money because now my mortgage payments is way higher than what, the, that what I can get for income. But yeah, I'm like, yeah. you're saving rent. Yeah, not exactly. Rent. exactly. So even if you're breaking even uh, right now, let's say that your mortgage is twenty five hundred and your rent is you know twenty six, twenty seven hundred, um, and you're making technically two hundred or you're not making any at all, you're saving that rent, and you have an appreciating asset. Yeah. Oh my God, it, it's unbelievable. So that house, <laughs> that house that I bought it to, uh, for two hundred and ten, I was paying. I was very nervous. I was paying full price. And that uh, house, uh, because I forced the appreciation by uh, renovating it and fixing some things, uh, and the, and how the market is, that house I just appraised for four hundred and twenty-five thousand. Four twenty-five. Yeah. Wow. So you've doubled your money in in yeah. uh, what seven or eight years. And Thanks. tell me, and and in terms of the, I mean, I'm just thinking back to, um, you know, the point where you're. You're you're renting it out to these other people and stuff like that. I mean, do is that kind of a when you when you have a visa? Uh, are there other restrictions, or is it just simply once you got the loan, you were okay to 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 rent it out to do all of these kind of things? There was no diff, no restrictions on you or anything like that. Yeah, no, definitely no restrictions. Once you become a landlord, there's no restriction for international. Um, so just getting your getting your foot in the door was the yeah. was the main thing. And you were what age at this? Uh, you were probably in your mid twenties, was it? So I'm 33. Uh, that was six seven years ago. Okay. So 20, yeah, 23, 24. Yeah. All right. So 23, 24. You don't have any money to put in a deposit. You go to the family. They give you ten thousand dollars. You've repaid that sort of slowly over a couple of years. 
And like, how did you make the next move into the next property? Like when, what was the time, you know, the difference between the first property and the second? Like how long of a gap was that? Yeah, so it, it took me like six months because um, that's, pre- that's pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're moving between, quite fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So between the first and second property uh, that I ever bought, it took me six months because I realized that um, I was not going to make enough money for the down payment. So I have to be creative. I'm like, how? The, the, the question that a lot of people ask, should ask themselves, is how can I make this happen? Not like, oh, I'm broke. I don't have any money. It's just being part of the solution. So that that mindset for me was everything. So at that time, I partnered with other people that have money uh, that I I had the knowledge at that time because I have some experience. Six months of landlording in the U.S. is is a good amount. Uh, It's not everything, but it's a good amount just because the tenants were not the most cooperative. I learned so much. Uh, and, And I have some people that with money say, hey, I want to invest with you. What can we do? Um, I have some money. Um, and I I took a small percentage of like the cash flow and the equity and the appreciation and tax benefits. I took 20%, which is small compared to what you can make. But I learned so much lessons and that got me into trusting uh, and get more trusted by my investors. Got it. Yeah. Like the first deal made me some money. But the second and third, fourth made me more money because yeah. they already trust me. There's already a relationship there. Got it. And so your so your second deal, yet you had a, a leg of the deal. We'll say like you had kind of twenty percent or something like that. Um, and how many you've you've managed now to acquire multiple properties? And uh, you're 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 managing thirty two doors. Did you say at yeah. this stage? So do you have, like, are you still managing a lot of that yourself or do you have a team now at this stage or how, how, is, how is it structured to manage? Because I know from my own experience, once it gets above a certain level, it starts to become pretty hands-on and pretty, you know, it's hard to manage, say, running a tennis academy and a property portfolio at the same time. Oh, I, I to- totally agree. So right now we have a small team of two, actually, I just hired a third person. Um, so one of the, it's they're part-time, she's a realtor. She's a great realtor. And, uh, but you know, the market is very uncertain. So she only does the property, uh, management repairs. So she, uh, when a tenant calls, which is majority of the landlord in business, right? The, the, those repairs. So I have another person that is a bookkeeper and she does, she started doing some leasing and she started making some payments to all the vendors. And then we have a third person now that's being dedicated for the showings. And these are people that are somehow in the industry that want some extra money and they want to be around investors. They want to learn the, the industry. So it's it's a win-win for all of us. Um, and, and they're all part-time positions. So we're and, three. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to ask in terms of like locate, identifying and locating people like that. Um, do you do you use virtual assistants or do you use people in the local area or how did you go about finding the people in your team? Uh, it's all through social media. Uh, people people only do business with uh, people they like and you know they know and they trust. So these people reach out to me, say, "Hey, I want to pick your brains about something." And accidentally, uh, I think it was meant to be, but accidentally. We went for, you know, we went for coffee and all that. And it, accidentally, the relationship start building there. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it, I think that's the best way to start a new relationship with any part of your team. Got it. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And so, I mean, you've, you're freeing up more and more of your time by having these people working with you. What do you spend most of your time on now? I mean, obviously there is the most valuable things that you can be doing at any one time. Like what have you identified that that's what you should be focusing on, right? Most of the time. Yeah. So right now uh, I'm focusing on acquisitions. I'm focusing on, um, we have raised, uh, when I say we, so I have a partner now um, that that I partnered last year. Uh, We have raised around almost $700,000. Uh, from other investors, and these are people that are um, 
you know, getting crushed in the stock market, the U.S. stock market. So they want that money to, you know, so I, I get I can guarantee them a certain percentage right now. Our rate is seven percent. So that way uh, they know us. They trust. We show we show them what we're doing. Obviously, this is not a syndication. This is just more like, a, you know, I'm buying a, a house. And uh, so I'm focusing on raising the capital. I'm focusing on uh, ac- getting the acquisition and also a, a very small part. I'm focusing on getting our system better, better, Got our it. management system better. And that's something that it keep, keeps evolving. This is not something that, it, it, you know, I spend r- right now two, maybe two hours a week on the management side on like decisions and, 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 and all that. But um, how are we going to optimize, how are we going to make these systems way better is where my focus is right now. Yeah, because if you want to scale, obviously, that's going to be the focus um, oh, yeah. on making it all work. And tell me this, uh, Andres, you you mentioned that you know people are investing with you. How are you finding, I mean, I've been reading about, I, I, I follow the news closely and I see the US market has registered a really big fall, uh, the biggest fall since 2008. Are you finding resistance because of the, those headlines or are you finding opportunities because of those headlines so i think uh, it, it's the markets are very local here uh and i'm telling you this because last week uh year over year in the, in the county that i uh invest is have grown uh 10 percent okay very so local a lot of p a lot of cities uh like california texas uh, some places in austin are getting crushed uh, because these are people. These are cities that grew so much, overgrew and, and speculation, over, spec- all the speculations, and then those are those are the cities and those are the markets the first to drop. Yeah, um, Connecticut it is actually more predictable because even though it doesn't grow, it doesn't lose a lot of people. So uh, it's a it's a boring market in the sense of like it, it's very stagnant, but but things happen very slow. Got it. So it's not falling off the cliff like like no. in the other markets because you've got stable kind of uh, demographics. You've got families living there and they're not likely to move to another location. Whereas speculators that have bought property just for the appreciation and then suddenly, oh, oh, the market's turning. They just dump the property on the market and suddenly the prices fall. <laughs> Appreciation is a uh, it's a gamble. Um, I I tell that to everyone that I know, all my students. Like, listen, um, you you can force the appreciation by doing some repairs, and that that's the best way. You know how much it's gonna cost to fix a house. You know, give or take, how much it's gonna appraise for. And even that, um, what I, one of the str- things that I'm doing right now, I'm not buying anything that I know it could drop. Like for example, let's say that I buy a hundred thousand dollar house, just a perfect example, um, and I'm buying it. I'm I'm making sure that even if the market drops at ten percent or twenty percent, I'm still buying uh, at that eighty thousand value or seventy thousand because we, I don't know. I think my prediction is year over year. I think nationally we're gonna see a drop of fifteen percent. Uh, let's say in August, September, which is that's when the start the market drop. Uh, I think Connecticut will see it maybe a ten. Um, but I think the the government is gonna keep uh, increasing those rates uh, to bring down the inflation. Uh, and I think that once the inflation is like you know four or five percent, then I think that that's when they're gonna stabilize everything. I got it. And in terms of when you're financing now at the moment like how are your what does your financing look like because i can remember two years ago i was talking to people and they were saying oh you know 30 year fixed rate at like two percent now obviously it's very different it's at six percent what are you you know are you fixing at this stage or are you what are you doing so our my strategy uh for the last year has been uh what we call the burr strategy yeah uh and and basically just to make it more simple I'm buying the properties with other people's money. Then I'm renovating it. I'm renting it out. And after six months, I'm refinancing with a bank. So now, you're paying back your, your, your investors. Correct. Okay. And then at that stage, you've stabilized the income and you've got the, you've forced the appreciation. Correct. Yeah. I forced the appreciation. I'm collecting good rents. That way, when the bank is going to refinance, they see that because uh, 
in the U.S., not only they see the appraised value, it's not only for the property value, but it's also what you're getting for rent. And that helps a lot. And one of the things that I do, I do is in six months, if the tenants don't have any lease, then that's my opportunity to increase the value inside the apartment by renovations. I, I even sometimes I say, I say to them, hey, how about if we change the cabinets? And obviously they're not going to say no. Or how about if we change the flooring or if we paint? So I force the appreciation, but I also in a few months say, hey, the 90% of the properties that I buy, 90% are under market value. So uh, I get them to at least market value, or at least I try to get closer to market value. So when the appraiser sees, okay, this building is in this condition, uh, how much are you getting for rent? They ask that, and they put that in the appraised report. So when my buildings always appraised for a good amount, because A, I make sure that it's clean and renovated, and B, I make sure that the rent is up to market value. Yeah, yeah. Makes can't sense. Like that, you know. So yeah. And tell me this: uh, How are you attracted? I mean, one of the big questions I have from so many people who are young and starting into this, you know, business, they want to know a couple of things. First of all, how do you get started? You, you've obviously you've outlined how you started by going to the family, your aunt, and asking for a loan and stuff. In terms of introducing investors and meeting local people, is it all through social media, as you mentioned? Yeah, so I think at least in Connecticut, uh, it's a f- almost a four million people uh, uh, state. Um, I think that uh, going on Facebook, there's a lot of um, Facebook groups uh, from the area. You can type Connecticut real estate investors or landlords or whatever. I'm going to meetups that uh, a few agents, real estate agents, have uh, meetups uh, to create value and maybe like pitch, you know, whatever they want to pitch. But um, I think those meetups are really, really good. Uh, And just connecting through social media. I mean, I have people that follow me from uh, Hawaii. Like I have people that follow me from all over just because I'm trying to create value. I'm not uh, exchanging. I don't charge for anything. I'm trying just to give, give, give. If something comes and I think big things are coming because I'm giving, giving, giving so much. Uh, we had uh, a, a person that comes through my social media that knows uh, a, a person that I done business with that says, "Hey, I have a two hundred thousand dollars here. Wow, I'm ready to? Yeah, like I trust you because I trust my friend. My friend trusts you like with her life. So I always say, like you know, just try to give, 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 and then take. And even if I know that a lot of people here that are listening to this podcast right now." Are new investors that don't have any properties or are renting or they have one home. My recommendation is like uh, track your own journey. You know, try to record. I'm fixing a toilet. Hey guys, look, I'm fixing a, fixing a toilet here. This is how you fix it. Oh, I'm painting the wall. Oh, I think this color is great for tenants because it's a lighter color and it makes the space looks bigger. That's how I started. I had no clue what I was doing, but I was just documenting everything and then just putting it on social media. So it's and like, yes, what, like yeah. I, what Gary Vaynerchuk says, jab, 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 right hook and document the journey. <laughs> yeah. I love that guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, no, I recognize, I recognize the telltale I've met, I've met Gary V once. Um, but um, in terms of, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. What, how, how would you say is the mindset, you know, a lot of young people. In fact, I got an email just yesterday and from a guy who's only 19 years of age and he wants to start in real estate and he's asking is that even realistic now that you know what you know what would you say I mean, what is the big defining difference in mindset that you have today that maybe when you were a younger guy you didn't have and 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 what what that difference is now like what's your mindset today that you yeah so that that's a very good question so I think that uh, the mindset that I, I always have, uh, tennis and sport always helped me to have a good mindset. But if I, let's say that I didn't have that, um, I think that having um, a routine that forces you to have some discipline is the best thing. And let me give you an example. So I'm, I am not a patient person. I'm a, pa- I'm a patient person with a lot of things, but I'm not patient with everything. So one thing that I 
do is I paint walls myself. And the reason why I paint walls, I can I have 10 guys, 10 contractors that can paint. It's not about money. It's not about it's it's about time also, but it's about teaching me how to be patient. Because you have to be patient when you paint walls. So you have to do activities that help you to have the, the character trait that you actually want to achieve, that you wanna the person that you want to be. So that's number one. Having a routine is so important about uh, waking up early, or if you're not an early person, you have to have an hour or half an hour every single day where you either read or you either take action about something that you want to accomplish, okay? And I, I always say that uh, I have um, a saying that it says that reading and ha- being educated makes you so powerful. But the reason why people don't take action is because it takes power from them. It just takes so much power. People feel deflated when they take action and they don't see the results right away. So what I will recommend is, uh, and there's a book that changed my whole life. It's called The Miracle Morning. Um, and it's I know a, it well. Yeah. Oh, I think I have it here in my bookshelf uh, somewhere. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good book. Okay. That changed Kyle my life. Elrod, yeah. How oh I my dream is to meet that guy. Uh, but so you know there there are things that you can do because once I start start waking up early, once I start brushing my teeth, give me that uh, uh, wake up uh, sense. I realized that I was starting to build wealth with, without even me knowing it. Just to get educating, reading every at least five to ten pages a day. I have never read a whole book my whole life. And those are one of the things that I wish I could have done in my earlier years. But not only like reading books, it's about also like taking actions. A lot of people just uh, love to read books, love to get knowledge, go to a lot of events, but don't take action. And the reason why people don't take action is because they get paralyzed when they don't see the results that they want. And one of the things that I do is uh, like people see the whole ladder. Right. Pretend that you have a 20 step ladder. The only thing that I see is the first step. The my, next my step. focus. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking at like right now, I'm looking at what is my focus and my focus. I don't see the second step. I don't see the third. All I'm seeing my focus like a camera is the first step. And that way, once I get the first step, then I can worry about the second. But I don't worry about the whole ladder. So. In, in, if we're talking about real estate, people think about what is like the whole ladder will be buying a house, right? Buying your first investment property. But what is the first step? Okay, how about if I get my finances in order? How about if I get a good credit? How about if I get my income stable? Okay, once I get that, let me go to the second step, which is education. How to analyze a good deal, how to underwrite it. Okay, once I get that, what is my third step? And, and you know, get... And all, it, it's about just seeing the first step and not seeing all the steps. That's the secret for my success. I think that's great advice. And it, it, when I think about it, 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 it mirrors a lot of the stuff that I say to uh, to my own coaching kind of clients and stuff. First of all, patience and discipline is, is critical in this business. I've been in this business 30 years now. So for me, patience and discipline, like if you don't have that, you're going to fall over because you'll get impatient and you'll make a, a rash decision. You'll jump into a deal and it won't work very well. So great advice, Andres. Um, in terms of the, um, I mean, the behavior that you've seen from your investors, I mean, do you have, um, like, do you have guys that are very successful that are investing with you? And like, they've got, obviously they've got lots of money ready to invest and stuff. Have you noticed habits in, in some of those people that you try to emulate or that you kind of see as as a as a hint as to how to go how to go and make more money yeah so this is very interesting uh the only habit is that they never give up the only habit persistence is like persistence that is a, that is a habit that they have uh and these people are doctors lawyers um business owners uh realtors uh that know about being a realtor but don't know about that they make good money but don't know about investing which is you know and um i think i think they're being persistent they they never give up they find a way to make more money and you know i don't know how you feel about this but like 
I feel like now investing is easier because everything, all the cash flow, all the equity, everything snowballs. The first property is by far the hardest. Right now, I feel like investing is easier. And, and I'm I'm trying to challenge myself to see other areas that uh, have potential without risking, obviously, none of my portfolio. But I think uh, it's just persistent. It's just like, these are people with every single, um, they're, they're all, they don't wake up early. <laughs> Some of them, they don't wake up early. Some of them, don't uh, just have they just have business business and they understand money and they understand their their finance, so they always it's a mixed to bag. Money. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, a mixed bag. And um, I mean, looking forward over say you know the next ten years, like what are your what is your kind of bigger picture? Like what does it what does Andres look like at forty five years of age? So forty five. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, going back to Dominican Republic. <laughs> And just uh, enjoying the piña coladas, Dale, and uh, good good uh, food and all that, uh, which my country offers. Um, um, right now, I'm looking to be fully present with my family. Um, but real estate is is a vehicle to get me there. Uh, real estate is a vehicle to um, create wealth and all that. Um, as a as a if we're talking about real estate, I'm looking at myself with a hundred units. Uh, or less, no more than that. You don't want to go beyond that. <clears throat> hundred yeah, is, yeah. is the kind of cap, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm mainly focused on, on like, what is the equity, what is the cash flow that I can build with a few units? Um, and I'm telling you this because I have 32 units, but like my criteria to investing is really um, strict in the sense of like, I don't invest in anything that give me less than $400 a month of, of cash flow per unit. A lot of people in the U.S. There's a there's a movement like, oh yes, yeah, a hundred, two hundred dollars. I'm like, I, I want to lose four hundred, and um, that way I have thirty two units, but I'm making the the cash flow of someone that have sixty, seventy units just because I'm doubling everything with uh, less work, right? So uh, I'm seeing my, yeah, yeah I'm seeing myself just enjoying with my family. I'm also seeing myself changing lives um, through. Uh, financial education. I think that uh, a lot of people can be benefit of, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems in the world already. Uh, but one of the things that I can do is given that financial base uh, from people from to go from poverty line to, to be successful. I know I can do it. And um, I see myself um, educating everyone about financial, but in, 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 um, in the area of real estate, uh, understanding finances. I, I've seen myself educating uh, teenagers about finances, which unfortunately in schools, they don't talk about. They don't that. teach. Yeah, they don't, they don't they, teach about that. So I'm seeing myself doing that uh, with help of a lot of people and growing such a big and, and awesome community that want to help other without any benefit, any personal benefit, but just putting it out there. I think um, giving back. Yeah, giving back. I think money, you know, uh, I'm I'm sitting here and all that. And, and a lot of people, one of my friends joke like, oh, you're a millionaire. You're a millionaire. You have several millions. But like for me, um, even in the pandemic, I have a lot of money in my bank account and I felt so empty. Like, OK, like this is a pandemic. There's nothing I can do. There's not, nowhere I can go. And then I realized like money is a, a, a good vehicle. And, you know, but um, giving giving others is what really uh, satisfy it really makes me sleep like a baby every night so motivation yeah that's yeah. great and um in terms of your uh, your own education i mean how how important is it to I, I i saw in your in your instagram that you have a book called who not how by a guy called dan sullivan and i, I know dan I, i've been part of strategic coach oh my god and I, uh, I, you got to introduce me to this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, in terms of your own education, like, do you do you invest in your education? Oh, uh, so right now, um, I invest. I, I'm pro and con against education. And let me explain. So I'm, I'm pro against the education that doesn't cost you that much. And I made a huge mistake. This is something that I want to tell my audience, that your audience, actually is that um so education about books about 
you know, some seminars about having a coach, personal coach, I completely agree with that. However, um, there's a big education thing that I fall. I didn't, I didn't say that earlier, but uh, I paid twenty two thousand dollars. Oh wow! For education that didn't serve me for anything, and I had a mentor for like a weekend, and she told me all that. She was, she was great, but uh, twenty two thousand dollars I spent for my education. Twenty two thousand dollars in books and seminars and 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 investing and making that mistake, maybe buying a bad deal can go far along than paying someone twenty a uh, company twenty two thousand dollars. So I so stay away for those gurus that tell you, oh yeah, uh, I'm gonna teach you how to invest with no money down. This is all my buildings. This is all my checks and all that. Stay away from the gurus that charge you big time. Yeah, and they brainwash you. Also, yeah. to I mean, if I tell you this whole story, you would not believe it. But they brainwash me, which I think was amazing. <laughs> Uh, you know what? It, it, it's worth going into that. I mean, unless it's painful for you to tell the story, but I, I, I said this to a lot of people that I see these programs out there for you know building your real estate wealth and all this kind of stuff, and the money they charge is extraordinary. It's you now twenty thousand, twenty five thousand for a program, and and my the, the the program that I have, I would say is better than those programs, and it's one fifth of the price. And I kind of think to myself, you know, capping it at around four thousand, five thousand dollars. To me, that's the amount that you can kind of make a difference Absolutely. without without putting these young people like in in debt. And I, and I've heard some tragic stories where people kind of take out loans to go and do these courses, and and they end up. So so tell us about your experience and and how do they brainwash you? Oh my god, ah, where do I start? So. Uh, I went to, this is how, it's, this is how big companies uh, want to take your money and they go in for, for sharks, uh, big sharks. First, they invite you to a day seminar, completely free, right? It's typically a Friday. Then they invite you to a weekend seminar, which is typically $300 or $400. You say, oh, I can afford this. I'm very motivated. I can do this. Let's just do it. On the last day, they teach you, if you don't have the money, they teach you how to increase your limit on your credit card. No way. <laughs> I'm not All even the tricks. Yeah. So they teach you how to increase the limit on your credit card. So at that time, I had a good credit. I have $6,000 in savings. That's all, that's all my savings. And, um, and then they, my limit was like eight to 10000 right? So uh, they teach you, they take like half a day just teaching you that, that how you're going to approach the, the bank and all that. And that's what I did. I called the bank uh, at night. It was a Saturday night because they were already brainwashing me. And uh, yeah, it was 22000 And I had, you know, majority of that on my credit card. And the reason why I thought about doing it, it was, it was because I had a scholarship in, from tennis, so I didn't pay zero for my education. I'm like, oh, what's twenty two thousand here in America just to get my real estate education? And you know, basically, it was a bunch of papers that you can find for free online. It was a weekend in Virginia where they have a lot of uh, instructors that were not investors, just instructors, yeah, just instructors. It's like you know, learning how to have a business. It's like in college, right? You go to college, is learning how to build a business but teachers, but not by business owners, right? Yeah and, yeah. and and that was for me, like a year later, I was like, how dumb I was. But, you know, um, I, I have some education and, and I have some systems thanks to that. But for 22,000, I could have bought a deal, a bad deal and be okay today in today's market. <laughs> and, and tell me, Andres, like at, at what stage did you realize you had made such a mistake. I mean, was it a short time into the program or was it at the end when you realized this cost me all this money and I have very little to show for it? Uh, it was like a couple of months after the program. Right. Uh, when I finished the whole program, again, it was a weekend, a bunch of paperwork, and uh, and then you, have, you set up a weekend with your uh, mentor that that person comes to your town and teaches, teaches you, right? Um, after like six, seven months, I realized like, this is not, this was not worth it. And the reason why it was because, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of education, a lot of platforms that offer free, at least just starting out. 
I will pay Gavin today 20000 to go to the next level today, right? But for a person that is starting out that is making, you know, the average Nothing. income here is like forty, fifty thousand, twenty thousand dollars, twenty two thousand dollars. That's a lot. That's it's not half, half their income. Their income. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So ed- education um, should should not be that expensive, especially for real estate. And I think that a lot of people and a lot of educators should be on the field of real estate. How can you teach me how to invest in real estate if you don't if you haven't any if you don't have any properties? Like how? Yeah. I just don't get it. I just don't understand. <laughs> Well, sorry to hear your your story, Andres. I know a, lo- a lot of people who have gone on and done some of these programs, and usually it's a high pressure kind of a sales environment where it's you know come in, buy, 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 and all this kind of stuff, and people feel this kind of like urge that they have to get the next little bit of value, and they can't get access to that unless they they pay this money over. So it's really interesting to hear that story. Andres, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the time. I'm just going to ask, you know, some of our final questions. I always like to ask, you know, first of all, what is the best advice that you've received to date? My best advice uh, was from my dad. Uh, and he didn't invent, invent this quote, but I live by this quote. It says, don't, crit- don't critique, don't condemn, and don't complain. And these are like the three C's, right? And okay. Spanish is almost the same. And uh, again, he, he didn't invent it. But uh, one of the things that I, I do to be like a better human and a better investor is like try not critique the people that are doing the wrong thing, even though I just, you know, kind of critique these people. But I want your audience to know uh, and be informed um, and, you know, don't condemn, don't complain. Um, it's all about try to live in, live in the moment and, and, um, and try to learn from your mistakes without complaining too much. I think like one of that's one of the things that high achievers have. One of the character traits that high achievers have is like they don't complain that much. You know, they they just get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have an an emotional problem, a relationship problem, yes, you have to take your moment and sink that in. But if you're in business, you you know you can sink it in for a little bit, but you have to be able to move on. You have to have that um grit to like just keep moving on don't complain let's just how, how can i solve this problem and yeah that's a that, that's the best advice i got and then, and then a uh, it, it's good advice andres what about the advice that you now would give to 18 year old andres who is uh, living in the dominican republic and is thinking about coming to america and getting into real estate um my first advice to those 18 year olds are you're hearing this is to not buy fancy things do not spend your money to impress other people that don't care and because that's that's the truth um i will definitely buy real estate (laughs) if i could (laughs) as early as Uh, possible yeah yeah i mean 15 years ago uh yes i will buy more real estate either with my own money or if i saved up or i will partner with someone with any family member i think that's the easiest way transition to invest and i will also create more value than what i asked what i asked for a person i think i was selfish at 18 years old and i was always asked or i was always trying to find um what is the the consequence if i if i do this instead of just giving unconditionally Got so it. those are one of the things that I that I wish I could have done in the past. Interesting. Well, Andres, uh, if anyone was interested to, uh, to to kind of connect with you or to you know um, find you online, uh, what's the best way to connect with you? So the best way is through Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is Andres Bernal, but instead of an L at the end, is a one. I, I'll uh, put a link. I'll put a link in the show notes so that awesome. people can find you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And and also Facebook with my name, Andres Bernal is A-N-D-R-E-S. And my last name is B-E-R-N-A-L. And yeah, through social media, I'm working on the website right now uh, for the branding purposes, but I'm really active on social media. So I'm trying to, again, like Gary Vee says, give, 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 and then one day jab. Jab, jab, jabs, right hook, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. And I see, I was just looking at your one of your reels there and it has uh, that you disagree with Grant Cardone. And so I said, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> All right, Andres, it's really nice to meet you and to speak with you. And uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. 
Thank you so much. It's been a great, uh, a great morning for me. And uh, yeah, maybe I can go to Ireland and visit you. Uh, uh, anytime. We're, uh, we're here. We're here and we're, uh, there's an open welcome for you whenever you come over. You're saying it live. So this is a proof. <laughs> if I show up, they'll <laughs> dismiss me. Just don't expect me to pick you up at the airport. But yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, All right, so Andres, take it easy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Andres. Good guy and uh, extended an invite to him here in Ireland. So if he comes, we might get him to one of my meetups on the Mastermind group. If you found this episode useful, please give it a thumbs up. And over to my right now, you're going to see one of the usual boxes that has some interviews and, uh, and a playlist basically of interviews that I've done over the past while. So have a look at that. Go and watch a couple more videos when you're finished here and we shall see you here next week. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe. Talk to you soon.